Hey! <laughs> Hello everyone, hi everyone in the chat, anyone from the future. My name is Guillaume, this is Thomas Guitars and Basses, and I'm here with Bob, the man who gents, Misha Mansour. <laughs> Are you, are you trolling? Are yeah, you yeah. trolling? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sorry, everything no, has to good. be a thing with me apparently. So yeah. yeah. Uh, how no, how, how is everyone doing? I'm I'm semi monitoring the chat, but not really because it's gonna <laughs> always be a disaster. But hello, thanks for joining us. I found out about five minutes ago that this was gonna be a live thing. I was preparing my my recording. I was gonna get like uh, you know. That way, guy. I always like to surprise people. Like, we'll, we'll record a thing. I'm like, and here's a wave file of my voice. Oh. You know, <laughs> like compressed and everything. You know, for you for you to have. So I don't oh, man, you should have. We like. Uh, t I think it was two weeks ago. There was Matt Heafy there, and he explained like just a signal chain for for his live streams, like from his voice, and he's going through like four EQs and two compressors, and it's like, and everything's oh. rigged for live. It's crazy. I've wonder. I've wondered, you know, because I've I've started to play around with the Twitch stuff. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And um, I've got Wirecast, which I think is what you're using right now, yeah. which is a very expensive program, and I'm just gonna say is a massive pain in the ass. But it when is. you get it. Working, then it's like then it's good but oh my god i i want to say it's been years of trying to get that thing to work and i really wish they could have like asked someone maybe like him or someone who knew what they were doing like yeah. how do you get this to work because i have no idea just getting like the doll audio to go through was a nightmare right yeah, in stereo yeah, yeah. Ooh. yeah so yeah, it's crazy so yeah, like you know, uh, I, I'm I'm glad that someone like that actually has their uh, rig together and they know what they're doing. <laughs> sure. No, he's definitely the right guy to ask if you've got any questions for live stuff. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for being here, man. That's uh, that's really cool. Very. Of course, man. Generous with your time. It has. I'm not gonna bug you with the fanboying stuff right now, but periphery does. We'll save that know. for the end. Yeah, for sure. Um, but. You know, um, Mark was my fir my first interview on YouTube. Uh, my first gig at Toman was an interview with with Mark Holcomb. With Mark Holcomb, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So wow. I got started on this, so I feel like pretty. Uh, there we pretty go. You got to collect them all. Now you just <laughs> got to get Jake next. <laughs> exactly, yeah. met Jake at now. Nah, uh, collection. <laughs> uh, it's a different kind of Pokemon Go, but right. it's really cool. <laughs> um yeah so yeah generally so we do that weekly i try to have like a main topic but it usually just goes off rails within the first five minutes so i'll just take sure. the first question give the people in the chat some time to settle down and then we'll uh we'll take these that sound good yeah yeah it sounds great awesome um so my first and only personal question <laughs> is going to be that because you were so much like on the forefront of of explaining the reality of working within the music industry um, and and mostly about how important it was to diversify within the industry to actually make a living off of it. Given the current times and the current circumstances and where we stand right now, um, has have your views on that changed? Have it got just even more, um, how to say that, legitimate in a way? Yeah. I mean that's a good question. Uh, it's it's one that's bound to get me in trouble. It always this question always gets me in trouble <laughs> since the first time I've asked it because I because it seems to you know I've I've always been a bit accused of this in my group of friends and whatever. I'm definitely the the dream crusher because I look um, at everything very very logically you know uh, and I don't account for emotion. Uh, not that I'm not trying to, but I just think it's very pragmatic, practical. I mean, you know, maybe Germans will like this, but like, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a very sort of, I, I just like to take pragmatic views of things because it's, why not? You know, it's something that'll actually affect how you make your decisions. And sure. for me, I want to be as well educated on the subject as, as possible because w life is hard. Why not have as much information as you can? When we were starting the band, I was just asking all the bands and musicians I knew uh, for advice and for, you know, for lessons learned off their experience so that hopefully I could skip some of the tough uh, things they went through. The things that I found was uh, just just common. No matter no matter who I was talking to, it seemed it was like everyone was like, yeah, we don't make any money. You know, and yeah, I was like, yeah, yeah. that blew my mind because it, these were bands I looked up to bands that in some cases um, were were in magazines that that were definitely uh, influential. 
yeah. and and household names in in the scene in the metal community and whatever. And they were all sort of saying this thing like, yeah, the record deals are terrible. We're not making anything off this record deal. We're you know it's very tough to make money off touring. We're just making money off merch. Like all these sort of revelations, which maybe now some people who know stuff in the industry are are more familiar with. But it just kind of got me thinking. Okay, so if I go into this, like it is disappointing to hear, but it's also like, well, if you if you're gonna go into this, then it seems like you really shouldn't be counting on this for money. Unlike yeah. another job where it's like, yeah, that is the goal. Like you work your nine to five so you yeah. can make your paycheck and that's your life, right? The, here it's like, okay, well, this job must be so awesome, and it is, mm. that it justifies not really making Itself. anything yeah, for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the logical next step is like, okay, so what do you do about that? The answer isn't, oh, you don't start a band. The answer is, oh, you try to see – what you can do to generate income, whether it's give lessons on the road, right? Yeah, like any, <laughs> but literally anything. Yeah, and I, yeah. I, yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's the way my brain is wired. But like when I see that, I see like, okay, so now everything's an opportunity, right? Yeah. A lot I feel of people. Like, see, I'm or, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I feel like a lot of bands are um, unfortunately uh, realizing that right now because they were relying so much on the fact that they could promote their stuff and tour and and do gigs even if it weren't you know making a full living off of that they were just relying so much on this then when you know everything everything came down and and stuff um they were just left like okay now what's that live stream thing uh, that the young kids do right, you know? right yeah you're seeing a lot more of that now yeah for sure um so to get to the second part of your question, you know, the, there are bands that relied in almost entirely off of touring that were mm. able to sort of make it work. They're in a lot of trouble, and it really sucks. Um, yeah. I, I, I really should preface all of this by saying, like, personally, as far as it, as it, as it stands, and knock on wood, but I haven't been negatively affected. Is it because I'm smart? No. It's because I'm lucky. OK, no, 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 no. And I should be very, very clear about this. It's it, the people that got screwed over by this thing didn't get screwed over because they're not smart. Let's oh, take, for no. example, someone who worked their ass off to start a restaurant and they start a killer restaurant. and They're crushing it. And then sure. one day they can't have a restaurant. What did they do wrong? Nothing. Yeah, they yeah. followed their dream. They did everything right. I just happen to be in an industry where, you know, especially with the the software company with GGD, like, you know, that that's good for us right now, you yeah, know. Um, sure. And um, and with the Horizon, like the demand has been there. It's been more on the the shipping and fulfillment side of things that you know stuff that's out of our control that that we've had problems, but the demand is there. That may change. It could be in six months if this keeps going or a year. That may change greatly, and then I don't look so smart, right? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So the the awareness of the, the this has just given me a lot of that sort of uh, in the back of my mind. There's always a sense of that fragility, you know, of all this. It could all disappear tomorrow. It's kind yeah. of in, it's set in it's set in my head by my parents, but you know, <laughs> moments moments like these. That's a good thing that is good yeah. parenting. Yeah, but it keeps you grounded, and it does sure. make you aware. Like, look, like you, you, like what I have. A lot of it is luck. You know, um, and that can all be taken away with some bad luck. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, diversifying has helped me here. Uh, but I also got lucky in the sense I diver diversified into things that this time around happened to not get affected. Who knows what the next thing could be? The next thing could oh. destroy me. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's a very real thing. And it's something that. I try to prepare for, you know, I have my, my money in like investments, retirement and all that kind of stuff, which hopefully I'll never have to touch. But yeah, I have plans. I have, I have like a several phase plan. If like all hell breaks loose or if like I lose everything or like, you know, the businesses and everything just don't, they aren't viable anymore. I have plans. And if I have to live a very simple life, uh, I can do that. Like if I have to just live in a, a small room and maybe not even have a car and just sell absolutely everything so as to not be homeless. Like I have a plan for that. So it's not a very pleasant thing to think about, but I think it's important to think about that stuff and to plan for it so that maybe it's a bit less of a surprise if it does yeah. happen. Uh, and at least you have a plan of action. But uh, no, I, I just got, I got lucky with this situation and that's just so far. If this continues long enough, maybe I will we'll get unlucky, you know? 
Yeah, yeah, no, I, I get that. And thank you very much for your, because there were a bunch of people asking already about how uh, COVID and, and the whole thing affected you financially and, you know, considering if it, like you do have multiple multiple sources of income. Yeah. And and because of that, and that's, that's what a lot of bands have been doing. That's what a lot of guys that weren't so much into YouTube or into Twitch just started to put content out there. It's... It's nice because you keep seeing them and at the same time you can, you know, provide and keep keep your artists and keep these guys alive. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You're you're seeing a lot more adoption with this kind of stuff because people really can't do anything else now. Yeah. Um so 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 it is interesting. People are sort of but but maybe they're being forced into this rather than sort of doing it willingly, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or um, forced is the wrong word, but maybe encouraged because there isn't, you know, there's no touring and there's probably yeah. not going to be any serious touring for for a while. You know, I mean, like, I, I don't know how it is over there, but like over here and talks I've had with our management and whatever, like they're, they're seriously not expecting to see touring until next year, yeah, realistically. Yeah, yeah. And there's a there's another thing to discuss there, which is. You know, I've I've had this discussion with people and we're seeing this a little bit with with stuff starting to reopen in the States. Um, which is you can reopen stuff, but it doesn't necessarily mean that people are okay with going, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And if you don't, if you only have for any business that operates at margin, if you don't have a certain percentage of your clientele, it might not even be worth opening mm. because it costs so much to open. And you know, the argument is like, Oh, well you remain closed while well, you're still paying rent, but it actually may cost more for you to open and not get the amount of customers that you need than to just stay closed. Yeah. So we're in an interesting time. And then that, that couldn't be any more true than with touring. You know, if you told me like, Hey Misha, like, so you're going to do a tour, but you might get like 60 to 70% of your attendance. Mm. Like that changes everything. Yeah. And maybe we definitely can't afford to tour at the level. Like then we're losing massive amounts of money. Like even if it's 80%, we're losing massive amounts of money. Yeah. Um, we operate at a very thin margin. The costs are incredibly high for touring. So then the options are, well, then we just undersell it or just uh, have very little production or something. But it becomes this thing. And you see this with promoters nowadays, like promoters who let's say you had a guarantee for this summer or for this fall or whatever. They're like, OK, well, if you want to go out now your guarantee is like two thirds of what it, or half of what it was because they don't know. Nobody yeah. knows. And whoever's going out first is going to be taking this massive gamble and they're going to be, unfortunately the guinea pigs. And I think they're going to be the bands that are maybe the most um, desperate or the ones that whether it's desperate just because they want to get out there or desperate financially, they're yeah. the ones who are like, well, look, I can't afford to not go out. Yeah. Uh, and we're going to be just sort of watching and waiting and seeing what happens because we have the luxury of being able to do that. And because I'm entirely unsure on how the industry is going to react and how fans will react. Like, let me ask you a question. Would let's say, let's say the, the, the government was like, okay, everything's open yeah. today, tomorrow. Would you go to a show with a thousand people no. and mosh? No. Yeah. Like that's I'm, me either. You know? Yeah. yeah. And, no, and I, that's feel, I feel that. So, so I think that's that's a that's a big thing. Is this is actually a psychological matter? It's it's not just sort of regulations. Yeah. Um, people people have been kind of messed up by this, and who knows how long it'll take them to recover or, or how they will recover, right? Yeah. So, um, that that's that's probably my main concern, and this translates to everything. This is I'm giving the example of music, but restaurants, anything public, like yeah. Uh, will be the same thing. Movie theaters. Do you want to? Uh, in any case, I'm trying to sit like a seat away from a stranger in a movie theater. But you know, now it might be like, <laughs> like, oh, you can only have 20% of the people in the movie theater. Well, is it worth showing movies then? Can yeah. they make money off that? Probably not. I don't know. So yeah, so that's that's my uh, general take on all of this. Thank you, thank you, man. I I I really appreciate your pragmatism and the way you you came out with um with all of that. You know, even so, honestly, for some people, bluntly. But I I really appreciate your take on this, and you're definitely someone someone that knows, you know, how it feels to have to go in different directions to make ends meet and to make it work. And so, yeah, 
Sorry, that was a bit of a heavy question. Sorry, everyone in the chat. That's all like, good. There's like some good. pretty chill questions out there. Like, <laughs> st- I started like I dropped it. So I'm sorry. Um, but yeah, thank you, thank you very, very much for that. We're gonna we're gonna take some questions. Some people. Uh, okay, okay. What what do we have? Um, all the questions are all dark now. <laughs> yeah. No, we we do have some chill. <laughs> we do have some cool stuff. How to become a meme master like you? A What's meme your, master. What was your not, process not, in mastering I memes? I think to be a meme master, you have to. I think you have to make memes. <laughs> I think that might be in reference to my Jackson takeover I did the other day, where I went a little hard. Yeah. <laughs> I went, I went, and the 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 truth is that I didn't want to do the takeover, but my you know my rep there, uh, Mike yeah. Tempesta, was like, "Hey man, can you do?" He's been he's been asking me to do it for like <laughs> for weeks, and. I hate takeovers, but I love Mike Tempesta. And I was like, okay, I will do it for you. And then they sent me like this this list of like, you know, I was like, I don't even know what I want to do for a takeover. And they sent me a list of like, oh, you know, you could show guitars, you could demonstrate some stuff. And I'm like, I'm going to do none of these things. I don't know. <laughs> that, that day I was just in a weird mood and I was like, we're, we're going to have some fun with this. Yeah. So yeah, I kind of messed up the the Jackson account for a day uh, <laughs> and made a lot of people very mad. I think a lot of people thought it was funny. And yeah. then there was like, there's definitely like some boomer anger, which was pretty <laughs> funny, which, which really just kept me going. Like once yeah. I saw that, I was like, okay, I have figured out what I'm doing with my day today. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I'd like to thank the boomers at Jackson or boomer Jackson fans for their inspiration. Yeah. They, they helped me find my path. Uh, and I'm very thankful for that. That was great fun. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. So that's that's how you become a meme. That's master. how you become a meme master. Just <laughs> anger the boomers. Uh, oh, Walid is here. Walid is a really cool guy, and he always has the best questions. He has okay, many sweet. questions, actually. Okay, let's take them in order. We'll do like a, a, a Walid minute. It's just going to be your questions from now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> does, does Misha prefer cars or guitars? Oh, oh. How honest should I be here? <laughs> <laughs> this is a place of, uh, we say, it's a, a safe space. space. <laughs> We're in a safe space. I really shouldn't admit this. Like, this should not get out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, cars. <laughs> cars, man. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Is I've loved cars as long as I can remember. I just didn't have the means to do a whole lot about it. Guitars, I didn't get into. I didn't start playing guitar until I was 14. So... Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, I liked, I guess I liked music, but I even had a late start with music. I was the oldest brother. I didn't have like an older sibling to kind of show me the ropes with music. Yeah, yeah. So I had to kind of be shown by, by friends and other people. So I had a bit of a late start with music and um, especially modern music and whatever. Um, so it wasn't until I was like 13, 14 that I was exposed to that stuff. And it wasn't until I was 14 and playing guitar that I was like, ooh, this, this is interesting. Maybe this is, you know, that, that whole path started yeah. to light up as a thing, right? Cars, like one of my earliest memories, uh, and this is my parents' fault. I can blame them because my 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 dad's an economist, right? He hates that I spend money on cars. You know, <laughs> like if he had his way, like I would never. I would. He's just like, why don't you invest it? I'm like, I invest money, but I also get cars. You know, he's like, you this could invest an more. Investment. Like, like we always have arguments because he he just really like both my parents hate that. Like yeah, like they yeah, understand. Yeah. I, I'm an adult. I can do what I want, but they're like. Misha, really? Do you you know? Do you need another car? Like what? <laughs> and uh, they 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 are not. They do not support. They support the music. They do not support the cars. Right. Um, but it's their fault because when I was like five, they gave. I think I were, I always had an affinity for cars, so that's probably why they gave me this like Ferrari F forty model. This like diecast model it was bright red. And I was just like, this is the greatest thing in my life. I, I've just decided this is now what I'm going to like forever. Thanks, parents. <laughs> and that inspired everything. So, you know, I, I've had a very I've, I've been very fond of cars for as long as I can remember. Um, and, uh, you know, as I yeah. said, like, I just didn't really have the means to do much. about it. So I'd always just be like dreaming, daydreaming and window shopping, but never seriously, you know, with the means to do anything about it. And then once once I could do it like like I say with cars I'm I'm I try to be responsibly irresponsible because it's probably the only thing that I really throw money at that's a depreciating asset so I don't like that 
and yeah. my sort of financial side of my brain doesn't like that, but yeah. it brings me so much happiness. Like yeah, the thing that's, that's for the car, yeah. it's like, it's like one of it's just, it's just my favorite thing, you know, take yeah. a car on some, like, uh, on some back roads and really thrashing it with your friends or going to a track there or, you know, anything like that is just, that is probably the happiest I've been short of like some of the best shows I've ever played. The best like shows I, I ever played only show. happen occasionally and I can go on a back road very easily. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I don't know. I'd say cars probably win this, but please don't tell anyone that I said that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they'll see as as soon as they tune in. You're wearing the right T-shirt, man. It's like you can't lie anymore. <laughs> no, right? <laughs> right? Um, but yeah, no, I I, I get you. Um, I would have said guitar, but for the exact same reasons. Like my history with car is mostly just watching people detail car on YouTube because it it just calms me down. <laughs> so, so I was just that's like, a good that's a good one so you like to detail cars yeah yeah i just yeah, yeah like cleaning a carpet that does it for me that's my thing <laughs> it is <laughs> it's like one of those like oddly satisfying things oh, so yeah. i can't oh, i can't do that here because i'm in an apartment building but the last place i lived like i had like a garage and whatever and yeah i got like a i got a pressure washer and yeah i used to i used to wash my cars and it's just very satisfying it is. so like like especially when you're done you're just like wow showroom quality you know and you can go down <laughs> You can go deep down that rabbit oh, hole, like oh, like yes. a two bucket method and clay bars and all that <laughs> stuff. Like, I definitely looked into that, and then I was like, no, this will become my life. I won't even drive my car. <laughs> I'll just be washing them. The whole That's time. the thing. Like always in these videos, the comment section is just like, but aren't you gutted that the minute it's out, it's disgusting again? Like yeah. by your standards. Uh, yeah, but you know. It's it's still satisfying. I well, I, I have this problem, too, because like when I go on my drives, like one drive, first of yeah. all, my my car is like a bug killer. So okay, like the what, what, what just, car, that was a question. I'm sorry. What car are we talking about? Someone. OK, <laughs> so I, so so because I'm very stupid, I bought myself a, a Lamborghini Huracan Performante, mm -hmm. um, which is which is, just, you know, it's a. Actually, the thing I like the least about it is that it's a Lamborghini because I do not care for attention. The car is for me, right? But that car does things that cars shouldn't be able to do. Like it, like it has active aerodynamics on it. You know, yeah, like yeah, yeah. It, that thing, that thing on twisty roads, unbelievable. It's unbelievable. <sighs> like you, you could be going really fast. What you think is really fast around a corner, right? And especially if you have camber working for you. You know, where like the roads like sort of yeah, yeah. yeah know what camber is it's like when the sort of angled in your favor so if the turn's going this way it's angled like that right yeah. and then you can use sort of like downward g-force for grip so if you start to feel understeer which is where the front starts to not steer as much generally the rule is you lift off because you're going too fast in this car you accelerate if you accelerate through the understeer it hunkers it down and down, goes yeah. even faster it's something i had to learn how to do because it's so unintuitive but it works i mean if it doesn't work then you're having the worst accident <laughs> ever but like but it works it's crazy this car is insane yeah. um and it allows me to have experiences that like short of like owning a personal roller coaster I don't know how I would experience these things like the G forces. It's such a visceral experience. Like yeah. after doing about an hour, hour and a half of that, you're you're mentally exhausted. You're physically exhausted. You're, you're sweating. <laughs> Core is all like worked it's out. Super, it's super. It's so demanding. Yeah, yeah. It's it, it, it. You know, and that's not even as intense as it would be at the track. At the track, yeah. you can go even harder. Yeah. But like, yeah, it's a very visceral experience. People don't understand that until they're in the car getting thrown around. Like you will get thrown around in the car if you're not holding on for dear life. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> please talk about how to live from music. I can't stand <laughs> cars. <laughs> Uh, all right, all right, all right. We're going back on. <laughs> this is why you shouldn't get me talk talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was some. Stuff. There was someone like say just when we when we started talking about cars. Like, okay, stream over. Bye, everyone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, well, uh, we'll try and but keep this, a healthy. This is the problem with the internet is that we've got a dude saying no cars and then a dude and saying more cars. cars. <laughs> <laughs> so no matter what, we're going to be disappointments. Exactly, but just trying to find a healthy balance. Yeah, know? we'll find a good, a good healthy balance. <laughs> um, okay, yeah, let's uh, let's jump back on uh, on music for a minute. Yeah, we let's. Had, 
Okay. Oh yeah, that was a that was a cool. Uh, actually, let me address this because I've seen this dude ask this feed up. Misha, why don't you sell Horizon devices stuff through Toman in the EU? It's a pain order from oh. the states. <laughs> We're working on it. We have some certifications to get. I was actually actually the the call I was on right before this was my Horizon devices call. Okay. So, so we are. I think actually that's. Uh, we're working with uh, Hans Peter on that. So, like, we're going to get that together. It's just logistical stuff. It's annoying stuff that just has to get done. Stickers, yeah. reg- you know, certifications. Uh, but, but uh, knock on wood, we get that done soon. Nice. Yeah. That's good to hear. Uh, yeah, I hadn't seen that question yet. So, well done. And then hopefully the strings. The, the whole the plan is to get, like, pedals and strings. Get a whole... Yeah. Because we love Toe, man. We, we, we want to we make sure that, uh, that you guys have... And we love you. Oh. <laughs> it works out perfect. <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I hadn't seen that. Bru, Bru, Bruno. Okay. Bruno there Logan. We go. There we go. Um, how was, where was that? How was that? Where was that question? How was the process of starting a company such as Horizon Devices and or, uh, you know, get good drums? Um, so, so Horizon Devices was something that I started with, uh, with, uh, a buddy of mine, uh, Maytap Bogle, who's this like serial entrepreneur, really smart business guy, mm. you know, and, and he brought in this guy, uh, Brian Gilmanov. So it's the uh, three of us are, are owners there. Um, and that's the thing is like when you, when you're starting a business, ideally you want to be starting with people that you consider to be trustworthy people that you think. And more importantly, or not more importantly, you want them to be trustworthy above all. Yeah. But but you want you want the 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 split of labor and skills to really fill everything out, you know. Yeah. So that way, like uh, Maytab, I, I you know he started out doing a lot more operations stuff, but then kind of now he does more big picture stuff, and he's mm-hmm. really just good at like like the the crazy like sort of money and financing side of things, you know, the serial entrepreneur, he like, he's, br- he's a brilliant, brilliant mind when it comes to that stuff. Some of the stuff he comes up with, I'm just like, Jesus Christ. Like he just reads about, I, he just, he's one of those guys who likes to make money to no real end, but he's really good at making money and really yeah, efficient yeah. with it. And he doesn't spend it. Like it's hilarious. He still like, just likes to eat like tuna out of a can with hot sauce for, for dinner. And it's disgusting. And he loves sending <laughs> us pictures because he doesn't really care about nice things for the most part. Uh, yeah. I think he finally bought, bought himself like a nice watch, which is like the first nice thing he's ever bought. But considering how much money he's made and whatever, like he really lives a very simple life. He just enjoys making money. But he, because of that, he always has like incredible insight on that end. And then Brian has kind of taken over the operation stuff. And we also have an employee now. So, you know, you just build up from that. We just kind of you know, we knew that I would be like the face and the influencer and the one sort of designing everything. But yeah, it, it was just it. it's something where it wasn't really that concrete because it was just good vibes. It just felt right. Um, but having a good team, having a good team is the most important thing, making sure that you are on the same page. We did little exercises like writing a um, uh, this is just for our own purposes, but writing mm-hmm. a mission statement and sort of a story as to why this company exists and why it needs to exist and all that. It's for our own reference. Yeah. But that way, if ever we have problems, you know, trying to determine what to do about something or a problem to solve or whatever, we could just reference that and be like, okay, well, these are, these are actually our mission statements. Um, so GGD actually was started, uh, with, with, uh, with Nolly and Matt, then Des came on, then I came on last. Um, and again, it was just kind of, we all, we thought that like we could all sort of tackle different uh, parts of the problem by all teaming up together, you know. Yeah. So um, that, that's the that's the lesson there. Just team yeah, up with te- team up with the right person. The right, yeah. This is not right this people. is not me alone. This is yeah. there's no way there's absolutely no way I could do this alone. I I I'm fortunate to be friends with and work with brilliant brilliant people. Like people I really, really admire and that I think are, are some of the most brilliant people who are genuine people, who are good people. Uh, so I don't have to question their motives or anything like that. It's really just about doing good work. Yeah. And, and, and we set standards for ourselves and we, 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 ha- we talk about these things and have documents to reference. Like what are our goals? What are the things that are important to us? So that Because sometimes you get carried away with stuff and you forget. 
well, we can always reference. It's like, no, like this is based off of what we said. This is how we would approach it. And it's like, okay, yeah, okay. easy. So, yeah, good people. Good people. Uh, good that people. was the, what, what you've been saying. That kind of echoes to a question that was there early on in the chat. It was someone asking, since it's a job and you, you're talking about, you know, production and facts and numbers and such, does it take anything away from your inspiration music going from a hobby to being a job um that's a really good question um so i i will say that I've, i i mean this happened to me and i've seen this happen to so many musicians um like like i call i call like the music industry like the machine or something like that but it just mm. feels like you get eaten by the machine so Let's just take me as an example or anyone that, that you could think of. When I started writing music, it was for the most pure of reasons. It was just I had a computer. I realized I could make music on it by myself without bothering anyone else. Yeah. And it was like, you know, Pandora's box was open, but a good Pandora's box. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. But it was like in the best way. It was like uh, I can now explore this fully on my own time. And it was the most amazing thing. And that's the only reason I was writing. It was like this exploration of this thing. And it got to the point where like writing just felt like something that I was just, ha I just had to do. Like, why uh, yeah. wouldn't you do it? Like, why wouldn't you eat food every day? Like, why wouldn't you breathe? Why would, if I have this, why wouldn't I do it? Um, and, and I was posting it up and people seemed to enjoy it or whatever, but like really it was just an exploration mm. and I love that. It was a very pure pursuit, but then that led to me, you know, being able to quit my day job and you know, use the band as, as my main source of income and, and, you know, along with all the other stuff I'd going, you know, it was a bit complicated, like I was producing and whatever at the time, but like yeah. I could shift from like traditional day jobs to quote unquote music in general being my, my main sources of income. And that seemed so fucking ideal at that point in time. Sorry yeah. if I can't swear. That's all I, right. That man. was an unnecessary swear They're too. All good. <laughs> <laughs> but but it was it was uh, so ideal at that point in time because why wouldn't you want to turn your hobby into a job, right? That's the thinking, right? Yeah. And this is the trap. This is the trap that no one thinks about is that once it becomes your job, then you, rather than doing things you want to do, now it becomes things you have to do, right? Yeah. Uh, and and we became very well aware of this with uh, periphery, like come come periphery two and all that. Like now. I mean, obviously we want to make another album, but we need to make it within this window because we've got this tour and this festival and whatever. Yeah. And I think we always did a very good job of making sure the music was sacred. Like the music never took a toll, but the process to creating the music take, took a toll. Yeah. The stress around making the music was was real. The The things we put ourselves through to appease labels, management, the touring cycle, all that, the tours we took, the things we said yes to that we didn't want to say yes to, everything that wasn't the music, yeah, became a compromise because now you're part of this machine that's more than just you. Now you're not just making music to make yourself happy or even just to support yourself, but there's this group of other people that now rely on you. Yeah. And you, this pressure eases in very, very quickly uh, and very gradually to where you don't even notice it's happening. And then you sort of like... There's a point where I was just like, I don't even know what the point of all this is. Like, I don't know that I'm very happy with touring and with any of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And it just kind of took me taking a bit of a break. It's why we took so long to do Periphery 4. We were just taking a break because I almost wanted to quit touring. Yeah, I was yeah. like, I don't think I enjoy this anymore. You know, I like writing and I like I like making music with the guys. But I don't like this this feeling of just grinding just to grind, you know? Yeah. And to what end? To not really make that much money and to, you know, what what's the goal? Like, I I knew we would never be a massive band. I didn't really care about being a massive band. I just wanted sort of fulfillment out of it. And this is the thing. You'll see a lot of bands go through this same thing. Yeah. Because that's what happens when you when you turn your, your hobby into a job is like it becomes a job. Yeah. So I fixed that by turning my job back into a hobby, which is why now I don't care what I make from periphery. Like we all don't care what we make from periphery. Yeah. We own the label now. Ironically, we do make more than we've ever done from periphery because the band's the biggest it's been. And we own more of all the parts than we've ever owned before. Yeah. But that's a byproduct. That wasn't really the, the goal was to reduce the stress. Our management, and our manager is completely on the same page as us to where, you know, 
we're not arguing about stuff. It's uh, the goals are always aligned and he can sort of anticipate our, our wants and needs and we control enough of everything to where we, you know, again, the music itself, cause a lot of people are like, Oh, you know, like oh, I didn't like that album. It was probably that label or whatever. It's like, no, that was the album we wanted to make. Like yeah. the music never suffered, but the stress around it is real. Yeah. That's, that's a very real thing. And we were able to eliminate that to where like, you know, Periphery 3 was a really good experience, and, and Periphery 4 was one of my favorite experiences making an album. Completely no stress, just a really good time. Yeah. And, it, and showed, I think that, it showed in the documentary. So yeah, that, yeah. That, that's my only experience. That's the only way I can relate to it. But the way you guys explain it and describe the, just the whole recording situation was was definitely more peaceful. Like that, the kind of peace of mind that you can only afford if you, you know, rely on if you have so much under control of course but you know also have that kind of time and that kind of time to yeah. set the job side apart and just focus on the creativity yeah i mean that that's that i'm glad that that shows cuz that was yeah. something that that happened as a result of us turning our job back into a hobby yeah. you know uh, or or however you want to call it but basically a lot it was us identifying like why why are certain aspects of this making us miserable all right now how do we fix that yeah. and then you know it's a it's a process it takes time it's it's half the the institutions in place and half the relationships and communication but we worked on it for many years and i think we're in a very good place now as a result so it's a lot really of hard good work to hear. that's really good to him um okay as a result, we do have a bunch of questions on, on periphery. Uh, we'll go to that in a minute. I just wanted to jump back on one of uh, Wilid's questions earlier because he did ask it several times. And uh, did you face any racism in the metal community? You know, that's a really good question. That's a really good question. Um, no. I don't know why. I think I've been... Maybe I've been lucky. I... I like forget that I'm not white. <laughs> <laughs> I've I've had like a couple I've 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 had a I've had a, a couple very light racism experiences just in my life in general, yeah. but they were more funny. You ever see that Dave Chappelle bit where he's just like, you know, something happened and he was like, I wasn't even mad. It was just like that's racist. <laughs> <laughs> just kinda of taken aback. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, that, I remember I, I was I was I was like in Massachusetts somewhere, of course. Uh, <laughs> it's a it's a very whitewashed part. Oh, yeah. I, I forget where we were. We were either like near Cape Cod or like uh, I forget where. I don't want to like out some some <laughs> like city one city. But, yeah. uh, <laughs> but like uh, but no, but uh, but the the girl I was dating at the time was like you know uh, white blonde hair, blue eye, you know. Um, and, uh, and we were, we were just holding hands, like walking to like a, a, a supermarket. And it was one of those, one of those areas where like, you know, I was definitely like the darkest person around for miles, you know, <laughs> like it's just whitewashed. Right. And we were just walking to a supermarket and there's just a dude who's just like, I, but he's not even looking at, it. he's just like, like because we were like, and, and I didn't, I didn't even know why he was staring at us at yeah, first, yeah, and that's yeah, when it yeah. hit me. It's like, oh wait, I'm not white. We're interracial. Like it was funny. Like I never thought of like I've never thought of being like in an interracial couple. But like, how sick is that, right? I'm <laughs> auto interracial if I'm with a white girl. But like, um, but you know, it all hit me at once. I was like, I was like, oh, that's like weird to him, and we just started cracking up. Yeah, we were yeah. like, that's so racist. Oh my god, that's <laughs> hilarious. Like I, I on like it's probably not the right reaction, but I did think it was like really funny. Yeah. But um but I have to say, like that maybe maybe I'm very lucky and sheltered, but like that's probably the extent of like the racism that I've encountered. It had nothing to do with music. It was just sort of being in an area where like I think we just blew some dude's mind. <laughs> it's like how does <laughs> how does but he's but how does that happen? You know? Like <laughs> That dude definitely had some soul searching to do. <laughs> Ron, Ron in the chat is saying maybe he just recognized you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> maybe that, <laughs> I don't know. You know, usually when people recognize you, they'll 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 wave or say hi yeah, or something. Yeah, yeah, this guy yeah. just looked. 
he like, you know, we had to help him pick his job off the yeah. floor. So, <laughs> but, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I will say, I will say like, I wouldn't use my example as an, or my, my life as an example of, of oh, what no, it's, it's typically it, like, because I think I've, I've been pretty lucky for whatever reason. I'm not really sure. Uh, I, you know, um, like, like obviously Tosin's one of my best friends. Tosin yeah. Abasi from Animals as Leader is like, and, you know, I used to assume that like he didn't really have any racist experiences, but he's had, he's had a couple of things, you know? Oh yeah. Uh, and he, he's been touring longer than I have. He was in this band Reflux, you know, back in the day. And like, that was, it's, it's weird to think about, but I think, you know, just even in the last like 15 years, like America's become a lot more progressive. So, you know, I think he was facing a lot of sort of latent racism or stuff, you know, the, the worst, the worst or not the worst kind, but the more, the, 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 the kind that's most likely to happen is, is the, the kind that stems more from ignorance than rather, rather than hatred. It's yeah. like the kind where people don't even think they're being racist or they don't realize they're being racist. Cause they're just like, Oh, that's just the way it is or whatever. But, um, he's told, he's told me some stuff. I'm not going to repeat his stories for him because that's for him to do. But like, that that's where that's where I was aware that there was actually because I used to believe like oh there's none you know like the metal community is like yeah. immune to it you know we're we're like this like really tight knit thing but it's like no no that's that's not true but I've just I haven't really been exposed to it in a way that that's affected me at least so I I would say I'm probably just lucky uh, and 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 I I don't really know what you do to address that. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, you know, I'm not, I'm no one to take part in that conversation, of course, uh, but it's, it's obviously, you know, good to hear, and it, I, I get that's a question that's kind of, that, thank you very much, Walid, by the way, for asking that because yeah, it's a good that, question. that's something you know you don't, you don't hear a lot, and something that you easily tend to forget if you, if you're part of, of a, of a community that's so. You know, you spend, you spend so much time with people from every, everywhere doing all sorts of different things but all linked to the one thing and because of that common goal you you tend to kind of black out the rest of the of of their personality of where they're from or whatever and so yeah it was uh it was it was good to to hear your, your, your one, thing, one, on thing I should, one thing i should mention is it's easy to forget that that's a thing because at least tend to uh exists perhaps more on the more conservative side of beliefs, if I were mm. to generalize. And we've toured with some pretty conservative people, but you won't see it from that, you know? Or yeah. maybe that's where it'll be more of the uh, sort of, uh, the, the, the the maybe some ignorant comments, but it's like, you know, it's not like a serious thing or anything like that. Like, like really, like with the tour, with the people that we've toured with, you, 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 you encounter all walks of life and cultures and everything. It's one of my favorite things about it. Yeah. It's like, it does feel like a very good mix of people and and backgrounds and stories. So you learn a lot from from the people that you tour with. Um, and that's why, unfortunately, it can kind of shield you because you can almost believe like, oh, yeah, yeah. everyone's open. And, you know, yeah. and you don't you're not even really looking for it, you know. But, yeah, yeah that's to just put a little end cap on that. You know, that's uh, basically how I feel about it. Thank you very much. Um Mortal Soul and Arkan are African met. Oh yeah, I've heard Arkan. Adam D. Is that the real Adam D? I've had that conversation before live. Is it the real Adam D? And then he never answered. Are you, are you playing in Kill Switch Engage? Yes or no? Please well, I tell mean, us. <laughs> I mean, I'd, I'd assume that there's a lot of Adam D's. In I assume as well, but as long as I won't have that answer, I won't <laughs> stop asking. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Are so. you the Adam D? Exactly. <laughs> um, okay, I, I was saying that, that's pretty. That's pretty crazy influence because Adam D is a painfully common name. Oh yeah, so yeah. yeah. Be, be Adam D, like that's how much influence that that dude's had. That like he can just take over <laughs> an incredibly common name. And it's like yeah, it's Adam D. Of course, you know. <laughs> It could, it, yeah, I he's, am a Adam he's, D. He's oh, a okay. Adam D. Is okay. that a technical? Do you see? One of, one of them. <laughs> he has both answered and not answered our question. Yep. <laughs> um, sorry, uh, periphery questions. Uh, yeah, enough talk about them. Schrodinger and Adam. Adam. <laughs> um, how, uh, so like relating to your 
a writing process for for P4, I assume, um, because we talked about that pretty much at that moment. How do you how did you set the schedule to write and and record? And mm. Take that kind of time aside and as yeah, being I've, independent, I guess. Okay, wait. So, uh, wait, is that an actual question in here? Because uh, I'm not trying to understand, but I'll, I'll answer that, what I think is being asked. I think do uh, do you set do you set or did you set a schedule to write and record? Right. Okay, so so what we did with P4 is we said we're going to take as much time as we want, right? So over the the course of it ended up being about a year, but we weren't recording that whole year. We kind of met up for like you know a week or two or whatever, and then we take a break. But it was one of the best things we did because we could we we finally had the luxury of being able to sit with the music. I think when you write something, you're always very emotionally charged, and yeah. there is this aspect of 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 like sort of recency bias. So whatever you've done last year, like yeah, that's sick. And then if you take a few weeks or whatever. And you come back to it, and especially my my big thing is write something else because then has that has recency bias, you know. Yeah. yeah. And then then you can take a much more objective look at how you feel about some older stuff, right? Yeah. And that's where we could sort of be like, okay, well, this is still holding up really well. I still love that. This needs work. This I haven't ever felt right about, and we still need to work on it. So we did a few cycles of that. When it comes to actually daily schedules. On the creative side, we tried to do that, but I find it does not work because creativity is something that really shouldn't be messed with. Um, so it's more like we're all and I know this sounds like such a cop out, but I can't tell you like how many albums I've just done this way where it just feels like we're hanging out mm -hmm. and an album happens, like just yeah. writing happens. Because at the end of the day, there's enough creative energy and there's enough creative desire that like it doesn't matter if we're playing like Mario Party or just, you know shooting the shit eventually one of us would get on a guitar and be like okay what is that okay uh, let's 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 yeah, go yeah, up to the studio and work on yeah, it yeah. and sometimes that happens at one in the morning you know so we're actually on like some sort of anti-schedule like we're really just serving creativity at that point sleeping at terrible hours but we have no other obligations so yeah. we can do whatever we want it's a bit of a retreat you know um and I do find the, that that's the best way to approach music. When we tried to do a bit more of a schedule, it became very difficult because it's like, I don't feel like writing right now. And then we just hit a wall. And then later, for no reason, that night at like midnight, we're just bursting with ideas. Yeah. So that's the schedule on the creative and writing side. When it comes to tracking and mixing, that's when we follow a strict schedule because that's not creative, really. That's mm. more just like busy work and it's yeah, a, you have something I don't really enjoy but it's something that has to get done right yeah so that's where we'll do generally like an 11 to 7 schedule um or you know 10 to 7 or 11 to 7 whatever but we'll take a break for lunch or whatever but that is one thing where if you do not manage it you can get burnt out very quickly you'll be like you'll start off like yeah let's do 16 hour days you know then by the end of that first week, everyone hates each other and you don't want to ever record anything ever yeah. again. So keeping a sort of eight hour day there um, and because it's work that you know what you're what you have to do and what you're going to do, it's very easy to just stop. Like the other things we're very strict about stopping at eight. You know, it's like it doesn't matter if it's just one more section or whatever. Just You know, you're yeah. going to do it tomorrow. Yeah. So you just you just stop and you stick to it. Because unlike creativity, we know where the end is there. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so that's how we sort of schedule that. And that's something that Nolly introduced because we did notice that we were like burning ourselves out mid-session, getting very frustrated. And that's something that I think really changed the process for the better. But we did have to stop doing that with the creative side because we're like, that doesn't work. Not yeah, for us, at yeah. least. So yeah, hopefully that answers all the uh, scheduling things. I think uh, I think it did. Uh, but yeah, the, the what you were saying at the end uh, again, there was someone uh, early on asking how long it took you guys to, you know, because there's three guitar players. That's you know, there. There aren't that many bands having to not not. I don't want to say concessions, you know, but like uh, it's it's a lot of creativity and it's a lot of opinions put in one room to make to work on the one thing and there was someone asking how long it took you to find the right mechanics of that mm. as a as a yeah chemi chemistry is the biggest thing man um because it's funny because i 
I don't feel that way at all, but I see why to the outside world they're like, wow, that's a lot. Yeah. That's a lot of ego, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, and maybe at one point in time it was, but it's been this way for so long where it's just we work really well together, and the main thing is that we are all just serving the goal of like trying to make the best music that we can, mm. and just trying. It does take some work, and it does suck sometimes when your ideas are not accepted, right? Um, but if you get over that. And you realize, okay, it doesn't matter that my riff didn't make it in. It's not a reflection on me as a person or whatever. Yeah, or yeah, yeah. And the goal is to make a really cool song. It's just like, you're just like, all right, everyone just put their best stuff in and let's see what makes it, you know? Yeah. And it's like, and the song will be so much better than any of us could have done alone. So that's sort of our approach there. Yeah, but it took, a, it took, it, you know, if someone's asking, like, how do I find that, man, that's just trial and error and communication you know uh it doesn't work with most people but i i'm very lucky to to have a band um that that you know we have we have awesome writing chemistry yeah. none of us are the best at what we do but together we're better than the sum of our parts that's ideally what you want to find it's very hard to find it took us a very long time to get our lineup together yeah. um but it does make the writing process very enjoyable it's never like an ego thing or whatever. And especially if you're taking time away, like I was saying, where you're, you're you're taking time away. If you have any sort of charged feelings, like, man, I really miss that riff. Like you'll find you don't care. <laughs> like, yeah. like if you take some time away from it, you'll be like, or if you're writing something else, you'll be like, Oh, I actually don't care that much. I just cared that I was contributing to this thing. And then it got cut, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So, Definitely. So I think if you just aware like that that it's normal to feel like that, but this is how you deal with it, it makes it a lot more manageable. That is wise. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank it's you just, very, it, thank dude, it's not much. wise. It's just literally like a lot of fights over the years. That yeah, yeah. Like that course, we we but, just talked. Know. We we're, we're now in a good place. Because it, you, you know, because it only you... took a decade. So you know. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's that's why it took you a decade of, of of going through all of that and figuring it out, so that yeah. people in a YouTube chat probably don't have to go through the same amount of trouble. But it's maybe gonna take, it's a lot of work. It's gonna, be, it's gonna be a lot of work. Sorry, guys. There's no <laughs> short. Maybe you get lucky, but like you know. Yeah. Maybe even I got lucky, but but uh, it, it's normal Still, for right. that to be hard. That's all yeah. you need to know. It's normal for that to be very hard, but that should be the goal. Oh, I can't have that. Uh, there were a couple of, of shorter questions because I just I just saw the time and we we're almost an hour in already. Um, uh, the Gospel of Mark was has been asking throughout the chat. Um, what was some of your favorite venues in the DC or Maryland area uh, to go see live shows? Oh, um, yeah. Uh, well, actually, like one of my favorites is actually one that we we, we play pretty often, uh, the Fillmore in Silver Spring. Um, seen a lot of bands there. I saw Ghost there. I saw Meshuggah there. Uh, I've seen a bunch of bands there, uh, and we've played there a bunch. It's just a great sounding room. It's a nice venue, uh, good vibes. It it didn't hurt that I used to live when I lived there. I, I lived like a five minute walk from there, so I could yeah. always go to shows and like when I was on tour, just walk home. Yeah. Uh, and it's a great area. Like there's tons of food and whatever. There's like everything you would ever want there. So I I like that. Um, shows at the nine thirty club uh, are always like that's a that's a legendary venue. Just uh, you know, a lot of people say it's like the best sounding venue on the East Coast. Mm. I saw Gojira there and Lamb of God uh, there back in the day. Um, yeah, like it was. Uh, uh, I've seen so many bands there. I think we play there once. We don't play there anymore because we have a, a, a Live Nation deal and like they're not a Live Nation venue. That's, a, mm. that's the politics of everything. Yeah. But um, uh, Warner Theater is great. I saw Petrucci's like. G3 or whatever thing it was called, the guitar thing. Yeah, yeah the guitar thing. <laughs> uh, the solo project thing that he was doing there. I've seen I've seen a few things. I think I saw um, Gen X there when Tosin was doing that. That's where mm. they were doing It's like a theater. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of good venues in the area. There's some memorable ones that are not good, like Jack's. If anyone's from the area remembers Jack's, that's like a small up and coming. Like it's a total dive. It's it's closed down now. But we that's where we would play when we were starting out. And I saw mm. Sugar there back in the day, and that was – amazing um i see mashugo a lot they're like one of the few bands i will actually go out to a venue to see because they're like my favorite band but yeah. um yeah there's uh unfortunately a lot of the venues that we that we 
played and saw uh, acts at coming up, like I've shut down. They're just not. Um, I don't know if Rams had live in Baltimore is still a thing, but like, yeah, we used to play there and we used to see bands there. So, uh, he's oh, my band played jacks. It sucked. That's funny. Yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I saw. Oh yeah, I saw Baroness at the film last summer. Killer venue. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, there was one on something that you got recently. How do you like the Omega amp you got the other day? Oh yeah, yeah. I don't know if uh, they can't really see that from here. Let's see if uh, we angle that. Can see it? Maybe. It's, I don't oh, know. Is, Maybe like. Keys so, and P. It's a, baby, it's a baby blue amp there. Um, oh, right. oh, it's awesome. So so obviously I have like a uh, uh, signature uh, PV or it's like a collaboration, like the okay. Invective. But uh, in true form, I still like ha- like to have my collections of everything. So yeah, yeah. I have signature guitars, but I also have other guitars. I have, so I have a signature amp, but I have other amps. They, they, they capture other vibes. Um, that Omega is like... I'd say it's it's very unique. It's probably one of the most unique voice amps uh, I've tried. But I'd say if I had to class it, it's probably in like the SLO Mesa kind of vibe. But like modern, hot rotted. Oh, there we go. We got pictures coming up. Thanks, Jamie. Pull that up. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Just now, everyone's automatically Jamie. I know yeah, your name's yeah. Philip, but you know you're Jamie now. Thanks. I don't Jamie. actually have the the YouTube window <laughs> open, so I don't, oh, you don't, I don't no, even I, know I what he's doing. He's I, pulling I, I it trust up. Him. Jamie's pulling it up. Thanks, man. Um, (laughs) but uh uh yeah that's the amp right there um it's just a super it's like a modern take it's weird we're in like this like strange golden age of like these like i've just been buying a lot of really cool amps because i feel like for a while like modeling was taking over and like a lot of the amps that are coming out were like eh, you know it's just kind of more of the same but uh that that amp really blew me away i mean i paid for it you know like i'm not not being given this for free not anymore uh and uh and uh and i was quite happy to pay for it. i was so blown away by it and same deal with the dover amp i got uh, i tried both of them at nam yeah. that's more of like a british vibe like hot rod british vibe but really just about as good as i've ever tried so i was kind of blown away by those i, I bought both of them because i was just like okay. okay and now i've got like my holy stack of tone now because I've got my hot rod of Brit amp on top, like the Mesa SLO vibe on the bottom and the, you know, hot rod of 5150 on the bottom. And like, that's pretty much all the styles of heavy tones I would go that's, for. So I'm, I'm pretty, I'm pretty tones. good. Yeah, pretty good. So right there. It's a good tower of tone. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, I've just joined, man. <laughs> that guy. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, they'll stay on the channel. So if you just join now, just watch the replay later. It'll yeah, there you go. There be, you go. That'll be good fun. Um, okay, I guess I guess one more question. I get thousands of cool questions there. PS4, I, I can go PS4, as long Switch. as you want, pal. <laughs> really? Don't tell me that. Don't tell them that. <laughs> That's what she said? That's I guess so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, PS4 or Switch? Uh, both, man. I mean, like, I and I do play both, but like Switch, I'm playing Fire Emblem, Three Houses on that. Like, <laughs> do portable gaming like that. The like, Switch is, yeah. You know what's interesting is like Nintendo has just always been this outlier in like the video game wars because you've always had like uh, Microsoft and Sony just duking it out. Yeah. Just and it's happening again. All the next gen stuff's coming out now. Sure, a lot of you guys saw the uh, the reveals and saw the Unreal Engine five reveal, which was insane, right? Yes. And uh, um, you know that that looks amazing. And like Nintendo can just go out and like put out like a not that powerful but clever piece of hardware, and everyone has to have it. Like they're just not in the in the equation, you know. Uh, they will still sell, uh, and and yeah, like you don't have to choose between PS four and Switch. If you do have to choose between the two because of your budget, I just ask if like portability is really that important to you if portability is important then there's only one app uh, there's only one option yeah. you know but if it's not um i just look at whatever exclusives are better but ps4 kind of crushed it there's so many insane ps4 exclusives yeah. uh and you are getting a kind of the golden age where like all the best games have already come out you'd have like you know so many insane games to play just mm-hmm. in time for ps5 so yeah it's really up to you. 
Um, we've, covered, we've covered games, we've covered cars, guitars. Yeah, just all my favorite there. things. <laughs> <laughs> We're just going to rename the stream Misha's favorite things. Yeah, yeah, this is, that's what you should just call it Misha's favorite things. <laughs> I um, like to talk about the things that I like. <laughs> But you, you talk about them well. That's a, <laughs> it's a different scale, a different set of skills. Um, okay, I'm I, I do I'm I'm, I'm going to have to go get dinner at some point though. <laughs> um, no dinner for me. <laughs> I'm in a good place right now. I'm absolutely not complaining. <laughs> um, okay, there were a bunch of questions on labels that I think were really interesting along the lines of of do you need a label and we've talked a lot about the negative aspects of labels but you know mm. they they also bring good things and if so yeah, that's, that's a very what? good question. Yeah, so you know that that's a very very good question with a with a pretty complex answer but I'll try to make it simple. Yeah. So um you know it it depends on your situation and what you're looking for. Can you release your music and be successful without a label? A hundred percent. So why would you want a label? Because it's an insane amount of work. And even just running our own label and all that, I see just how much work it is. And we have a team that helps us with it. And our management helps us yeah. with it. And if we didn't have our manager kind of overseeing everything, I mean, he does so much for that. Like, And, and, our, and our team, I would never have started a label at least not in the scope that, that that we're doing it you know something that actually can like get successful releases out there and you know so like we we chartered with uh periphery four like to get to get that kind of volume and operate at that scale like just r right out of the bat mm. would be really really hard if you didn't know what you're doing and have a team that can handle it or basically want to put in so much work that you're like, okay, uh, I'm just going to not work on music right now and leave it to the other guys. Yeah, I'm yeah, yeah. You know, so where the label comes in and sort of where, where we, uh, where we try to be when we're working with artists is like, you know, maybe you will net more at the end of the day. Like maybe, uh, you won't net more being with us. It really depends. We can't guarantee that. Mm. Uh, we do try to offer good royalty rates, but, you will not have to do any of that work. And like if time and stress are things that, that you're trying to basically conserve for yourself yeah. uh, at the cost of maybe not making any more money or making slightly less money or whatever it works out to. Mm. Um, if those are things that are important to you, uh, then, then yeah, then you should, then you should sign to a label. There's that uh, kind of peace of mind, yeah. To, well, to, it's to, just you can now focus on being a musician because yeah. it is an insane amount of work. Yeah. And then the other thing being sort of unsigned versus signed is although I think you and I know that there isn't – that doesn't really mean anything to be signed mm -hmm. and maybe the industry is starting to tend more towards it meaning less and less, yeah. it still does mean something. It, it still has something – some, some uh, aspect of validation – uh, having a manager is a very similar thing. Like, I, I, I don't know how to put it, but like if there was a band that wanted to tour with us and we knew they were not signed and they didn't have management and they wanted to open for us, they would need to have more hype than anything on the planet. It would have to be one of those things where everyone's like, oh yeah, that band, they're so insane that who cares, right? Yeah, yeah, but in yeah. a lot of cases, it'll work against you. And, and we're not usually just choosing one band. We're choosing a bunch of bands. Those bands probably aren't even getting sent to us. They aren't even getting considered because it says a lot about a band's experience. It doesn't mean it's always true. No, but there's so much to sort through that you need a shorthand. So yeah. a lot of the industry will not take bands as seriously if they don't have, if they aren't signed and if they don't have uh, management uh, that can affect it too, just because it, it's just sort of shorthand of like, you're not a serious band. Does that mean that they're not serious? No, but That's it's just perception. And that yeah. perception, although it is changing has not fully changed over yet. So that's a reality. So those are the two sort of advantages that you will get signing to a label. Mm. Could you potentially make as much money 
or more money doing it yourself? Yes, but only if you handle it well, only if you're on top of it. A lot of times I see, I I can't tell you how many times I've seen a band be like, you know, I think we're just going to do it ourselves. And then because they know nothing about marketing and distribution, they'll have like a little bump on that first day. They'll make a hundred percent of those profits, but they they really aren't maximizing anything. And then Overall, they're probably netting way less than they would have just going with the label deal. So yeah. that's the gamble. If you really think, you know, like at this point, for example, Periphery, if, you know, if we did our label and we didn't put any work into it, we would have made a bunch of money and it would have been fine. We made a lot more because we handled it well, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're also at this point where it's like we could have gone the lazy route or whatever and we would have seen something for it and maybe still made about the same or more than we would uh, with with a traditional label deal, but because we put the work in, we really maximized it. But if you're just starting out, you know, I see a lot of people with, uh, with uh, who are just starting out, be like, you know, like uh, screw labels. I'm like, you are the guys who probably could benefit from this the most. The most. Yeah. It's like as you get bigger and bigger, that you can start to ask the question whether it's worth it. But mm. the smaller bands, like that's where you really stand. Like when you need to be putting as much work as possible then into as many areas. You don't need another thing to worry about. You don't need the entire label and management side of things to worry about. And, you know, obviously this goes without saying it's only as good as your deal. People are like, is this label better? Is that label better? It's like, that doesn't matter. Your deal matters, Mm. you know, because at this point, like you could be on the biggest label and if you get a shitty deal, you're screwed. And a very small label that can offer something aggressive may actually just net you more. Mm. So it's all about the deal. That's, that's what I'll say. But uh, yeah, as I said, it's a very it's a very uh, complex answer, and there's a lot of moving parts to it. But some sh- semi short summary. That's how I feel about it. Yeah, no, it was there was a lot of really good insight in that, and uh, I mean, to the extent that I know, the industry really echoes what a lot of people have been saying about it. Yeah, yeah, you probably have seen this firsthand, or you know, you you, you know what I'm talking well, about. It, it, no, but it's yeah. No, it was it was really insightful. Anyone in the chat that was wondering about labels, I would uh, I would definitely trust that uh, that that opinion at least. Because it wasn't biased; it was just very straightforward. This is yeah. This is, the, this is the reality of it. Well, well, here's the thing: is like I may be biased because I own a label, but like the, the the truth is like our label. The main purpose of our label is to put out our projects and side projects, yeah. and to just help our friends put out like we don't care like the label again doesn't the label itself doesn't make that much money if anything Mm. it's just trying to stay solvent it's just a vessel for us so and it's something to help out our friends like we're not trying to take over the industry with our label so it puts us in a pretty advantageous position to offer like very aggressive deals and and whatever because we don't care that much about making money and we don't have offices we don't have you know we don't have our overhead is so small compared to other labels we're not competing in that same market, you know, <laughs> find find a find a good deal, people. Regardless yeah, of the that, label. is the, that is that is what we <laughs> walk away with. It's like it's all about deal. Find a good deal. Um, thank you very much for your answer. Uh, I'm okay. I I think we're gonna take like one last question. Sure. And close uh, it off with a good one. Exactly. Well, let's, let's give because right now that's a lot of pressure on me to pick the right one. So I'm nope, just gonna pick, pick the right one, or else, dude. Or I'm else. just gonna I'm just gonna pick several, and we'll see which one we finish <laughs> on. <laughs> uh, no, there was a, there was a fun one earlier. Who who is Stan? Stan, they're probably talking about uh, uh, Hail Stan. They're definitely talking about that. <laughs> see, that was a typo. It was supposed to be Hail Satan, and then in printing, someone messed up. Someone who shall remain nameless, uh, because they're also dead to me and <laughs> fired fired from life. Um, and and our album, which was supposed to be called Periphery for Hail Satan, got called Hail Stan. So we just rolled with it because when you have so many copies printed and everything printed with a typo on it, what are you gonna do? This you know. So brilliant. that's who. Yeah, this, that's who Stan is. <laughs> this is so cool. <laughs> Like we've talked about a lot of cool stuff today, but that is what is that? What is the meaning of that? It was a typo, dude. Calm down. Yeah, it's just it's it was supposed to be Hail Satan. We are a black metal band and we worship yeah. the devil. And unfortunately, uh that just got messed up in printing and now we can't 
properly. So now we just worship Stan instead because <laughs> it's just easier to change our beliefs over a typo, in yeah. my opinion. Yeah, that again. Yeah. The the moral of that story is surround yourself with good people who can yep. type. Yeah, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> typing typing is a useful skill. Yeah. <laughs> Um, man, thank you so very much for your time. That was a blast. Um, no problem, man. That was a lot of fun. <laughs> we need to uh, we need to do that again, uh, just with Matt Heafy as a, as a third party, so he can teach us how how how. Yeah, it'll be stream. like you guys sound terrible. What yeah, do you think right now. <laughs> <Exactly. You know? laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> no, but th- thank you again, very very much. Thank you to everyone who watched, th- everyone in the chat for the great question. And yeah, they, thanks thanks to the chat. Those are some there were some really good questions. You yeah. guys, are, you guys We're, are awesome. We've got the best community. <laughs> you actually do. It was pretty different from what I was expecting. So good job, guys. Um, yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Oh, Michelle and Adam again. D, big fan. And Adam D, one one of the Adam Ds. <laughs> I, I I'm just gonna believe that you are the Adam D and oh, say big fan. Love your guitar tone and production and riffs and everything. So yeah. <laughs> Uh, right. but uh, yeah thank you very much you guys uh, stay safe uh, keep playing music and uh, yeah we'll, we'll see you very soon either here or Misha on his channel or Twitch or wherever he's going to stream on in the future or live twitch.tv slash Misha Periphery there you feel go feel free to follow join and all that stuff. smash like and subscribe or smash no, they like have, go, they don't go. have either of those things but you know whatever <laughs> Go stream every single Periphery album day in and out and yeah, no, uh, yeah. yeah support your local artists. Uh, thank you guys and uh, yeah, we'll see you soon. Bye. <laughs>